Good morning, Grace Warman. Uh, welcome here this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here along with Clay. We lead this church together with Jared, who is an elder apprentice here. Um, if you've been with us over the past couple of months, you'll probably know that we've been going through the book of Philippians. And today we're going to be wrapping up this book. And we will be in uh, chapter 4 of Philippians. We'll be starting a brand new series uh, next week in the book of Proverbs. So if you could turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. If you're not exactly sure where the book of Philippians is, it is uh, near the end of the New Testament portion of the Bible. Uh, so if you're flipping, it might take you a little bit to get there because it's quite a small book. Or you can use the search function on the app if, if you're using a Bible app rather than um, the physical paper version. So we'll be in Philippians chapter 4. Taking verses 14 all the way to verse uh, 23 this morning. It's a bit of a larger chunk than we have been tackling over the last while, so uh, we will get right to it. You will hear the scripture video played out on the screen behind me, and then we're going to uh, pray together and then dig into this passage that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. Reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 23. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right, let's just pray before we dig into that passage. Father, we just want to say thank you today for your great love towards us. And I pray that as we go through um, this scripture this morning, that our, our love for you would be stirred up and, and that we would be motivated to serve you, not out of a sense of duty, but rather out of a sense of how great you are and what a privilege it is to work for you. And I pray that our, our service to you, our, our good works, that they would just flow out of this worship and adoration that we have for you, knowing that it was your son Jesus who gave up everything for us so that we might have life with you. And so I pray that this truth would not get old to us, and I pray that it just continues to give us this joy and passion to serve you with all that we are and with all that we have. And I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so we're going to jump into this text right away this morning, verse 14 of chapter 4. Paul says this to the Philippian church. He says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Now, without any context, this verse doesn't really mean very much to us. And if So we have to take a peek back into last, week, last week's passage, and then we can more clearly understand what Paul is saying here. Last week, Clay brought us through verses 10 to 13. And what we saw in that passage was, was that Paul had learned to be content in every situation that he found himself in whether he was in need or if he had plenty, whether he was sick or healthy, uh, whatever was going on around him, whether we, he was in prison or whether he was free, um, he, he was able to be content. He had Jesus, and Jesus was enough for him. Jesus kept him fulfilled. Jesus kept him content. Jesus kept him at peace. Jesus was his savior, his hero, his treasure, his king, his God. Jesus was everything to him, so the circumstances of the world around him did not dictate to him whether he was content or not, or whether he was at peace or not. All of that for Paul was found in Jesus. 
And so that, that's why he could say in verse 13, I can do all things through, through him or Jesus Christ who strengthens me. He didn't mean that if he put his mind to it, he, be, he could become a millionaire or heal his own body or, or things like that. What Paul meant was that anything that popped up in his life, he could go through it by the power of Jesus. If he was poor, that was fine because his true riches were found in Jesus and his kingdom. If he was in prison, that was fine because he could have peace and contentment in that because his true freedom was, was found in his freedom from Satan, sin, and death, which was all given to him by the work of Jesus on the cross. If he was sick, he could go through it and find peace and contentment in that because one day he would receive this new and perfect resurrected body because that is the promise to those who are in Christ Jesus. For Paul, nothing on this earth was as precious to him as Jesus Christ. And so that is how he could be content in all things, even in the very difficult circumstances of life. He could go through anything through Christ. And as he's writing this, he is enduring imprisonment. And as Clay brought out last week, this Philippian church was concerned for Paul while he was in prison. Even though Paul said he could go through anything by the power of Christ, they showed concern for him, and they had sent him Epaphroditus, <clears throat> sorry, Epaphroditus, so that while he was in prison, um, Epaphroditus could take care of his needs. Epaphroditus, he ministered to him. Um, he took the supplies from the church to Paul, and this all was a blessing to Paul to have Epaphroditus there from the Philippian church. Now, even though Paul said he could do all things through Christ, we see that one of the ways that God made this possible is through the church. God's people came, come, come around us and help us through these difficult seasons. And this is what was happening with Paul. Even though Paul seemed to be this super Christian, um, able to do all things through Christ, he gladly welcomed this help from the Philippian church. Even though Jesus was enough for him and all that he needed was Christ, he was super thankful for the church that helped him in this time of need. He's thankful that God used his people to supply his needs, and that's why he wrote verse 14, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Now, even though God gives us the strength to endure, sometimes that strength and that ability to go through the things, um, or <laughs> the ability really to do all things through Christ who strengthens us comes through the church that God has put around us. It comes through fellow believers. And, and it was for this encouragement and this generosity that Paul was super grateful for, even though he knew that if he did not receive the generosity from the people around him, God would have sustained him. And, but it was still an amazing blessing to receive these good things from God through God's people. Verse 15, Paul continues on. He says, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Now, Paul here, he continues his thankfulness to this particular church for their participation in his life and in his ministry. At the very beginning of Paul's ministry, when the good news of the gospel of Jesus was still very much unknown to the world, Paul says at the beginning of the gospel, when it was just a small group of people who believed, none of the other churches that Paul had planted had entered into partnership with him, but this Philippian church did. When, when he left Macedonia, when he left Philippi, then he, he entered into partnership with them in giving and receiving. Verse 16, he says, even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. Now, Paul was extremely thankful because this Philippian church had supported him financially and with gifts in the work of spreading the gospel, even before any other church would or could. They had truly partnered with him. They were all in, willingly generous, so that the gospel could spread through the world, through the Apostle Paul. Now, here at Grace Fellowship, if you've been with us for some time, you will notice that we do not use the word membership as a way of understanding who is part of the church and who is not. But we use the word partnership or fellowship, you could say, because ultimately the word fellowship means partnership. The Greek word that Paul uses here for partnership is the same word that's often translated into fellowship. So over the years, the word fellowship, at least in church circles, has lost its true meaning. 
We often think of fellowship as getting together with other believers, maybe having a church potluck or a games night or something like that. And those are good things, don't get me wrong. But we'll describe that type of time together as great fellowship. And it can sort of be um, partially fellowship, but what fellowship really means, the deeper meaning is it's, it's a partnership, a deep commitment to one another. It's like the fellowship of the ring. Now, I don't, I don't like the Lord of the Rings movies myself. I know you guys can, you can mock me all you want. I did watch the first one some years ago, and it's three hours of my life that I will never get back. But <laughs> even though I didn't enjoy the movie, it does a really good job of showing us what fellowship really looks like. Essentially, if you haven't seen the movie, it's an eclectic group that is on one mission to bring this ring somewhere to destroy it. And if I remember correctly, they encounter all sorts of issues uh, along the way, and they persevere through these problems that they encounter together. And as uh, they do this, uh, this group, it's made up of like, I think, four hobbits and two men and an elf and a dwarf and a, and a wizard. It's really this weird diverse motley crew uh, with not much in common other than the mission to bring the ring to the place of destruction. And this group is called a fellowship. They are partnered together deeply for one mission. And that's why we don't use the word membership here at Grace. The church is not just some country club of which you are a member, but it's ultimately, you could say, a military alliance or a partnership a fellowship to fight Satan and his army, to proclaim the gospel so that the captives might be set free. This is ultimately what the church is. We partner together to do this. We're a group of, an, of, of eclectic people, a fellowship, partnered together on mission for the advancement of the gospel and for the glory of God. So when you say that you are a part of grace fellowship, it means that you are all in on the mission. There, there's no turning back. We all have to have one another's backs to complete this mission, to make it to the end of life here on earth by faith in Jesus. And this partnership requires us to continually point one another to Jesus, to continually su support one another, continually uh, looking for ways to support the mission instead of looking for us or for ourselves for ways to be served. But we look for ways to serve the mission instead. If I'm a member of a country club, I expect to be served and doted on. But if I'm in a fellowship, I'm expected to serve for the mission. And this Philippian church understood that. And they were in true fellowship or true partnership with Paul. And it meant they were on the same mission as he was. Even though they were not with him in person, proclaiming the gospel and planting churches while he was on his missionary journeys. They were ensuring that the mission was moving ahead by supporting him in what he needed. They sent gifts to supply his needs so that he was not hindered on the mission by trying to supply for his own needs. The gifts from those at Philippi ensured that the mission could continue with maximum effectiveness. Verse 16 again, he says, Even in Thessalonica... You sent help for my needs once and again. So while Paul had been off planting a church, the Thessalonian church, the Philippian church was making sure that he was cared for while he was there. And if we read the letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we find out that these Thessalonians, they were not generous at all. So these Philippians, they had picked up the slack and given to Paul for this work that he was doing among the Thessalonians, even when the Thessalonians refused to give their own generosity towards Paul and his mission. This is the commitment that the Philippians had towards the mission. This is the strength of partnership that they had with Paul. They supported the mission financially so that the good news of Jesus Christ would be proclaimed in a new place and a new church might be planted so that the kingdom of God would grow and that God would get the glory. They were in fellowship with Paul on mission, and for this, he was grateful for them. Verse 17, Paul says this, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. 
I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So Paul, he kind of snaps back to the present here. After reminding them and thanking them for their partnership while he was on his missionary journeys, their generosity while he was church planting, he now thanks them for the gifts that they have sent to him while he's in prison. These gifts that physically sustain him. Now, the Roman prisons, they weren't um, all-inclusive as our Canadian prisons are today. Uh, You needed to get your own food and your own clothing, which meant you needed someone to do that for you. You needed someone to care for you. And so the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus there to do the hard work of caring for Paul. He was, uh, Epaphroditus was from Philippi, and he took the gifts from the Philippian church to Paul in prison and, and ensured that Paul would survive. The mission had to continue. These letters that Paul wrote from prison would form a large part of the New Testament, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus to generations of people even today. The generosity of the Philippian church has had an everlasting effect on the churches throughout the ages, including our little church here in Warman. We're reading the results of the Philippian generosity. We are, when we're committed in a generous partnership for the mission of the gospel, we can be assured that our gift to the mission will not go to waste, but have everlasting impact in the kingdom of God. Anything given to the mission will be used by God. For the Philippians, it was financial generosity, and for Paul, he gave his freedom, his comfort, and ultimately his life for the gospel. The Philippians might have lacked the ability to teach and preach like Paul, and Paul kind of lacked the ability to make money like the church could. So together they formed a fellowship for the advancement of the kingdom of God. The good news of Jesus Christ and his gospel, it would not be stopped. And I find it interesting as well that Paul said he didn't seek these gifts from the Philippians, but rather he looked forward to the fruit that these gifts provided. And this fruit would be to their everlasting credit. He looked forward to those who would be saved because this church had partnered with him in the gospel. He looked forward to spread the gospel because of their generosity. The money was nothing to him, but it was the results of the gifts that he was excited about. The more they gave, the more he could travel and plant and preach, and the less he had to worry about taking time away from his preaching and teaching and to, to build tents and make money that way. He, he loved this partnership not for the money, but for the souls that would be saved through their generosity. He has learned to be content in all things. And now here in prison, he says that he has received full payment, meaning that he has more than enough. It wasn't the money that motivated him. It was the lost people that needed to hear about Jesus. And since Paul had planted this church in Philippi over 10 years ago, these Philippians had been a great source of joy for Paul. They had ensured that the mission would continue, that it would not fail. And and if they had any worries that they were being too generous, he reassures them with verse 19. He says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He's reminding them, you cannot give too much in God's kingdom. You cannot be too generous in God's kingdom. God will supply your needs. Paul reassures them of this. They had, been, they had been overly generous, you could say, but they need not worry. God is using all of their gifts for his glory and for his honor, so this church doesn't need to worry about their needs. They would be ultimately taken care of. God, who has immeasurable riches, will supply all that we need in the day that we need it. There is nothing more important than the mission, so if we are in fellowship, As a church, on mission, we need not worry about ever being too generous. God will give us what we need when we need it. And when he does this, it will be for his glory. Verse 20, he says this. He says, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. When we are generously committed to the fellowship of the gospel, we will see our needs supplied in every way, and when God does this for us, it is for His glory. 
He is the king of the universe. He is lacking in nothing. And we can never outgive God. And no matter what, he has the ability to make sure that we are taken care of for his glory and for his honor. And so what does this look like in the here and now? Well, what, it, what does it look like today in the local church? Or, or, or as Grace Warman, what does that look like? Well, at this time, we as Grace Fellowship are a group of three local churches and on mission together. What Jesus has done in coming to earth and living the perfect life, life and dying our death so that we might have life and then rising again so that we can live with him for eternity, this truth is so important that we have formed a fellowship to be on mission to proclaim this gospel just as Paul and the Philippian church did. Locally, we are in fellowship with Grace Saskatoon and Grace Evergreen for the advancement of the gospel. We were planted here in Warman by God's grace out of Grace Saskatoon. And what Grace Saskatoon has sacrificed for our good contributed to the proclamation of the gospel here in Warman. And through that proclamation, Jesus has saved for himself a people here in this community. Grace Saskatoon was generous in giving to us financially when we could not support ourselves, much like the Philippian church was generous to Paul and the church in Thessalonica when they could not support themselves, also that Jesus would be made known in that community. It also means that we here, in turn, partner with Grace Saskatoon to plant Grace Evergreen so that the gospel might be proclaimed in that community where there really is no other church. The good news of Jesus is just too good to hinder by the lack of generosity. Even though Grace Evergreen could have been planted without any support, God could have made that happen. But if we partner with him in the gospel mission, it is kind of us to do so, but more importantly, we get to share in the credit for the fruit that comes out of that partnership. Right here in this church, in this little city, it means that we're all together on this mission. When one person has an opportunity to share the gospel, we get to partner with them in that, and we share in the fruit of that. Now, some of the ways that we can partner in the gospel together here locally, with Grace Saskatoon, Grace Evergreen, maybe it's through financial support of someone, a pastor maybe, who preaches on Sunday, so they have time to study the word and accurately handle God's word and proclaim the good news of Jesus. Maybe it's through hospitality or, or bringing in refugees from war-torn, war-torn countries. Maybe it's through uh, foster parenting. Maybe it's through making meals for those who need meals. Uh, whatever it is, We as Grace Fellowship are all part of a fellowship of God's grace. We are together as one, not because we're all the same, but because God has graciously brought us us into his family. So it means that all that we have is for God's honor and his glory. Our home, our time, our money is all for the glory of God. It's all for the good of the mission. So then we have to ask ourselves, have I been generously in fellowship with God? the local church, and the larger church outside of our communities as the church at Philippi was? Has my house been used for the building of relationships for the proclamation of the gospel? Has my food been consumed for the sole purpose of supplying someone's needs so that the gospel might be proclaimed? Is my money being given generously so that those who are on the front lines of mission in the community and across the province and the country and the world so that they are being supported and they don't need to shrink back and try and sustain themselves physically? Is my time being used wisely for the fellowship? Or do I treasure my time so much that I keep it all to myself for my pleasure and for my good? And I think if we look deeply, and maybe even not too deeply, into our own hearts, we're going to realize that we're probably more like the church at Thessalonica than the church at Philippi. And and that's not a compliment. The church at Philippi 
had to cover the costs for the church or for the Thessalonian church for the mission of the gospel in that community. And as part of the leadership here at Grace Warman, we don't look for your gifts that we'll provide and the But we look forward to the credit that goes your way from the fruit of those gifts. We don't look for the gift itself, but we look for the fruit that the gift brings and the credit that goes your way. When your efforts and your possessions and your money and your relationships are given for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus, this is big and it counts. And there is reward for that. It's kind of like investing in a startup company. I I don't know if you've ever, ever done that before, but you might get this CEO with a great idea and all he needs is to bring some capital, some funding uh, into this project to bring it to life and He thinks it's this great idea, and it might be a great idea, and he convinces you to put a chunk of money into his company so he can achieve this mission of bringing this idea to life. And so you invest, as do others, and the company is off to a small start. But after 10 years, um, your investment has increased a 1,000 times its original value. The product was a great hit, and the company's flourishing, and whatever you sacrifice to invest in that company is really nothing compared to what you have now. You see, it was the same for the Philippian church. Whatever they invested in the advancement of the gospel some 2,000 years ago cannot be measured today. Such is the increase to their credit. Now, the difference between investing in a startup company and investing in God's kingdom is that God doesn't need your money, but boy, would he love for you to share in the reward. Jesus doesn't need your money to accomplish his his purpose. Just like Paul said, he could do all things through Christ. He could accomplish the mission of Jesus with Christ alone. Jesus was enough, but he wanted these Philippian people to share in the reward, and they have. Think of all the people that have heard the gospel down throughout the ages, through, through the pages of scripture that Paul wrote, and because much of it, was brought about through their investment in Paul's ministry, they get to share in that amazing reward. Now, I long to see Grace Fellowship reap this same reward. I long to see you reap the reward for eternity for what you have invested into the mission of the gospel. Your time, your talents, your efforts, your your patient endurance, your money, your love for others, your encouragement, your, your discipline, all invested into Jesus and his kingdom. The eternal reward, I can guarantee you, will be immeasurable. And all for the glory of God. You get to participate in bringing honor and glory to God by investing into the proclamation of his good news. This is the privilege. This is the opportunity that Jesus has set before us. So let's do it. Let's not just talk about it. Let's make the effort to do the things of Jesus, to invest all that we have, our time and efforts and talents and money, possessions. Let's invest it all into God's kingdom. There, an investment reward is guaranteed. Jesus paid for our place in his kingdom with his blood so that we might have the, the assurance that whatever we do for his sake will be rewarded with abundance, eternal life. It might mean, for some of you today, it might mean you, you open the checkbook up or send an e-transfer. It might mean you invite someone over for lunch. It might mean you risk your reputation and have a conversation with a co-worker about Jesus. It might mean you give up your weekend to volunteer. But we give up what, what we hold dear as Jesus has given up everything for us. We serve others as a picture to our community and really to the world of how Jesus has served us. This is investing in God's kingdom, a kingdom that we now get to be a part of. And this brings us to the end of Paul's letter to the Philippians, the last two verses, verse 21 and 22. He says this, 
Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. He greets all the believers in Philippi one last time and sends greetings from those who are with him, caring for him, including those from Caesar's household. These people from Caesar's household would have likely been guards or servants that Paul has gotten to know during his imprisonment there. And it seems that even those who held him captive were his newfound friends in the gospel. The gospel brings even the most likely people into fellowship or partnership with one another. He calls them saints, these members of Caesar's household, brothers in Christ. Just as the grace of God was with Paul, he wishes for them to experience that same grace so they could be content and at peace in every situation. Paul could endure anything by the power of God's grace, and he wishes for them that same grace. And verse 23, last verse, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. My prayer for all of you is that as a fellowship on mission for the gospel, that, that we would experience the grace of God in our spirits, as Paul did, that whether it's in plenty or in need, in, in freedom or, or in chains, in sickness or in health, that we would be content and at peace, knowing that the God of peace has us in his hands. We don't need to worry about anything. We can endure or go through anything through the power of Christ Jesus who strengthens us in fellowship with the church. Let's pray. Father, I just want to pray for this church, this local church right now. Would we take these words of Paul to heart and would we invest in your kingdom with all that we have Every part of our lives, our relationships, our stuff, our time, everything. I just pray that we would invest in your kingdom, not because you need it, but, but rather that, that, that we would get to witness this incredible fruit that is brought about by investing into your kingdom. That it would be to our credit and that we would get to rejoice with you in this new life that the good news of the gospel brings. I pray for a steadfast commitment to one another, to you, to the mission, that we would be in true fellowship with one another, that we as a diverse group of people would be on one mission for the good news of the gospel that is made possible by you. I pray this in your name. Amen.